All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and, you know, once again, welcome and good morning to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Um, today's webinar is Key Plants, Key Pests with Dr. Taylor Clem. He'll review some common pest issues and what to watch out for in our landscape plants. Um, this webinar is approved for one FNGLA, um, one Florida Water Star, and LAIFCEU. So there is a $10 administration fee if you want to receive a certificate for continuing education. I'll go ahead and I'll put that link in the chat box once I'm done here. Um, and you can follow that to make payment for the certificate. Um, and as I said, this is part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is Hurricane Resilient Trees with Dr. Ryan Klein. And please note your microphones have been muted um, and put any questions that you have into the chat box and Taylor will be monitoring that and, and Tom will help um, and we'll answer those at, probably at the end of the presentation. Um, and one other thing I'm very excited to announce that we'll be opening up the Florida Friendly Landscaping Awards program this July. This award program is held biannually to recognize projects and people who are making a difference in Florida's environment. There are award categories for both professionals and homeowners. And if your home, community, or project qualifies as a Florida friendly landscape, this is an opportunity to really highlight your achievement. Um, the winners will be showcased on the FFL website and on various social media platforms. They'll be shared with other extension agents throughout the, the, the state. So it will really get statewide recognition. Um, another benefit that we see is winning an award can provide, you know, both your company um, and yourself recognition for your achievements, and it can also motivate your employees. So please consider um, submitting your application next month. I'll put a link for that as well in the um, chat box, and we hope to hear from you soon on that. You'll also see a survey inv invitation pop up at the end of this. Um, please take the time to fill that out. It really helps us guide what type of educational programming we're going to offer in the you know, upcoming months and years. Um, and so with that, I'll turn um, this over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'm Tom Wickman. I'm the statewide coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program, all, with, all part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, our speaker is Dr. Taylor Clem. He's uh, with the UF IFAS Extensions Alachua County Environmental and Community Horticulture Agent and Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator. Whew, that's a mouthful, Taylor. Um, he's a graduate of University of Florida and University of Kentucky. He has two degrees in landscape architecture and a doctorate in horticultural sciences. Dr. Clem has worked as a graduate student for University of Florida's Center for Landscape Conservation and Ecology and has experience in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, Landscape Design, and Behavior Change. Since gra graduating from University of Florida, Dr. Clem lived in Farmington, New Mexico, working as a parks planner for the city's parks, parks department before returning to UF IFAS Extension. Taylor is originally from the Midwest, but grew up outside of Jacksonville, Florida, spending much of his life uh, exploring the outdoors. Taylor has been able to explore many of the nation's natural wonders, but calls Florida his home. Whenever Taylor is not working, he can be found hiking, canoeing, or exploring the world with his wife and two boys. Um, today, uh, Taylor is going to be talking to us about, you know, one of those topics that I think is terribly important to, to all of us is trying to figure out and be able to anticipate what might, might be happening on uh, your various plants that you have in your landscape. And one way is through knowing what to expect. And so with that, I will turn it over to Taylor and uh, he's going to be discussing key plants, key pests. Go ahead, Taylor. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me to come speak uh, this uh, today about the key plants and key pests. And, you know, when I look at the whole list of different plants that we have across the state, you know, especially the plants that we're seeing, not just in certain parts, but all across the state, you know, it's a tremendous list. So what I want to do today is just we're going to hit some of those major plants that we're seeing across the state and some of those key pests that we might see with them. But um, before we get started, you know, I always start all my programs off with these big essential questions. And 
the essential questions for today's program is what is integrated pest management? Because if we're gonna be talking about pests, I think it's important that we briefly talk about how do we maintain and man or sorry, how do we manage the pests within the landscape? And then the second essential question is what are the key pests to key plants in Florida? Um, and we'll also share some of these resources from the online links that we do have with the university that could be really great tools for you to just know where they're at and how to find them to help look up some additional information. So integrated pest management, what is a pest? Um, how do you define a pest? Put it in the chat box. Um, how do you answer that question? What is a pest? Let's see what you put in. Yeah, yeah, anything that kills my plants. I like that one. <laughs> one person put my dog. That's it. Yes, some days my dog is a major pest in my landscape. <laughs> Nasa species. Mm hmm. Excellent. There's a lot of things coming in. Things that damage crops, landscapes, and humids, uh, plants or animals where I don't want them to be. Um, anything that is unwanted in an area, anything to disrupt plant material. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So I put this image of just the insects up um, because sometimes, you know, people think of a pest just as an insect, but there's way more than that. Um, so we kind of look at as a pest and uh, Oh, you all pretty much got the nail on the head with this one is any unwanted organism in our landscape. Um, whether it be a plant like an invasive species or an animal like our dog, um, <laughs> or it could be like a possum, raccoon, you name it. Um, but insect, bacteria, fungi, virus, etc. So it's kind of looking at anything that is unwanted in our landscape, especially if that thing is causing uh, damage to our plants. So that's kind of that big umbrella term for, you know, what and how we define a pest. So when we think about integrated pest management, we, we need to think about, you know, what is the most sustainable ways that we can control those unwanted organisms within our landscapes or, you know, within our crops, agriculture, etc. Um, and that's where the integrated pest management program kind of comes into play. So um, essentially, we can define uh, integrated pest management as just that pest management strategy based on social, environmental, and economic consequences. So we look at what's the easiest way to maintain to what's the most intensive way of maintain uh, or ma maintenance uh, with regards to those consequences. So we look at IPM from this basic structure as you know, prevention to intervention. And we want to start at that base. What's those cultural controls? So following those best management practices for our landscapes, making sure that plants are in the right plant, they're the right plant for the right place. So if we follow those basic cultural practices, it's a really good preventative strategy to help reduce any type of pest issues that could occur within our landscape or reduce that threat or potentially help landscapes be more resilient to pest damage. Next is more of that physical mechanical control. So if the culture, if you're following the best management practices with regards to cultural control and you need to do some type of intervention, think about those physical or mechanical. So when I work with homeowners, I always joke that one of the most, uh, the basic uh, physical or mechanical tools that you can use for managing pests in your landscapes would be just a shoe. You can squish the bugs if need be, but you know, that's the basic intervention methods. Um, the next is biological controls. So that can be, you know, thinking about the air potato vine, air potato beetle is a wonderful biological control that we've used to help manage that invasive species or that landscape pest uh, throughout the state. And, you know, if you're still following this cultural and you can't manage things physically or mechanically and the biological controls aren't being effective, then you can, okay, that's when we can start to think about those other chemical controls. Um, and that's more of that intervention type management. So by following these kind of steps, these tiers is what IPM uh, or that integrated pest management is, is the cultural controls working your way up to those intervention, which is that chemical control. But it's really important to always know that whether you're a homeowner, you're working professionally, um, you're managing uh, professional landscapers, um, 
scouting and understanding what's happening in the landscape is the one of the most important steps into IPM. So this lady in this image, she is clearly not just pouring, she's not washing her, her grass uh, <laughs> with some soapy water, but she's actually looking for what? Do you know what she's looking for? Put it in the chat box. Someone wrote squish works for lovers. Yes, yeah, great. So yeah, we're looking for mole crickets. So that soapy water kind of percolates down and it, uh, I think it like helps, it pushes away the oxygen or it helps remove some of the air in the soil. So then the mole crickets start to just, just night of the living dead. Uh, they start climbing up out of the ground. It's um, Dr. Adam Dale has a really cool video where he's demonstrating this. Um, but there's other, some people put chinch bugs in the chat, in the chat box. And there's some other really cool tricks similar to this that can help you identify and look for chinch bug damage within your turf grass. So, you know, not just mole crickets and chinch bugs, but just regular scouting, scouting and looking for pest damage you know every seven to ten days is kind of the recommendation you know during the middle of like our summers or spring times when we have high humidity and it's during our rainy season you might want to check a little bit more frequently if you can um because what that's going to do is it helps you stay on top of maybe some type of fungal issue that might pop up so you know scouting is really really important uh, to make sure that you catch any pests early before they get really bad. And then working through that cultural to that prevention to intervention, that cultural to chemical control. So, um, and this is important because when we think about the state Florida friendly landscaping program, you know, principle number six is that manage yard pests and managing yard pests is the IPM strategies. And if you start with right plant, right place and follow those best cultural controls, you're going to help have a strong, resilient landscape that has, that has the ability to manage this pest in itself and help reduce the likelihood that you're going to have, um, a, major pest presence in that landscape. So let's go ahead and let's talk about those key plants that um, and those key pests because this is what we're really curious about. So um, you know I looked at all the plants that we can do so I picked some of like the most common landscape plants that we see across the state. Um, and you have the ability to find all these different methods of control um, through the University of Florida's websites on, on Ask IFAS. And I will make sure that at the end, there's a list of resources and where you can go to find some of this additional content. But anyways, so we'll talk about azaleas, palms, crepe myrtle, hollies, and juniper. They are gonna be our key plants that we talk about today. So let's go ahead and jump right into it and we'll talk about the azaleas the rhododendrons so um there's there's a lot of different insects and diseases that you may see on some of these so what i'm going to do is you'll see a list of some of those key pests that are associated with these plants but we'll kind of hit a couple of them to talk a little bit about those control methods and ways to properly identify um that pest that's causing that damage or identify what that pest is. So with rhododendrons, uh, some of the major uh, insects that we see is going to be the azalea caterpillar, azalea lacewing, as well as the gall midge. And they all exhibit different types of uh, damage or symptoms or signs of damage, same with the diseases. Um, and that allows us to work on that identification. Some of the diseases that we'll see are uh, uh, Cercospora leaf spot, uh, Ovalenia petal, and wet root rots. So um, sorry if I pronounce some of these words wrong, especially when I start pronouncing the uh, genus of some of the fungi later. But anyways, so let's talk, uh, we'll talk about one of the insects and we'll talk about one of the diseases that we can see within uh, the azaleas. So the first, the, the first pest I wanna talk about um, is the azalea lace bug. So the azalea lace bug, we can identify it. You're gonna be looking kind of at the new growth. You're gonna have like the stippled looking pattern, chlorotic leaves. They're, they're tiny, they're about an eighth of an inch to quarter of an inch, but you can see them. Um, and they have uh, cream colored bodies and they have lacy wings. 
Um, and you can see it in this, these images right here. So, um, you know, the, the, the nymphs of the, the lace bug are what you're seeing up on the top uh, image, and the adult is what you're seeing on the, the bottom image. So you can definitely see that they're clearly identifiable. Um, you know, the, the early nymphs, they do, they lack the wings, but they have those like little black spikes and have those black marks on their backs. But it's important that when you're looking for some of these insects as part of identif identifying them is knowing where to look for them. So one of the common places is to look under the leaves. That's where you're going to see a lot of the damage or a lot of these damage caused insects are going to be on the underside of the leaves. So, you know, these images are specifically what the insect looks like, whereas this is uh, the damage that you're going to see in relation to them. So it, obviously, that's at the top side of the leaves, so we're not going to see that damage, but on the underside of the leaves, you know, this is where that insect will be. So, you know, timing, knowing when you might see these can really help with that identifying and man so you can then make sure you manage appropriately. Uh, so the timing, uh, you're going to probably have about three to five generations of this insect per year. Um, so and that's you could see them year round. So it's just a matter of just making sure that you're scouting regularly. If you have azaleas, if you had this issue before, make sure you're checking to see if you can stay at on top of the issue um, before it gets too out of hand. Um, but it's really, it's nice if you have a hand lens, if you have the ability to use one of those, check the underside of the leaves with the hand lens uh, for that proper identifying uh, identification of them. So if you do properly identify the lace bug and you need to make sure that there's management. So uh, I guess this falls within a mechanical, you can spray them with a hose. Um, but you can also use like neem oil, insecticidal soaps, or other approved insecticides to help get them managed. So yes, you can see them on um, on azaleas, and they do cause some damage. But it's important to know that they are definitely controllable, um, and you can use some mechanical or some light uh, chemical controls, which would be like that neem oil, insecticidal soaps. So um, that's the azalea lace bug. So um, the Cercospora leaf spot, uh, this is identifiable because it has these circular angular brown leaf spots on leaves, uh, it has green, and if you look closely, you can with a hand lens, you can see like green, brown, green and brown fruiting stalks on them. So the timing is going to typically be, you're going to be late summer early fall is when we're going to see this. And it's usually it's going to be associated with high temperatures and humidity or leaf wetness. Um, this, is a, this is a very common um, fungal pathogen that you'll see um, not just on azaleas, but you'll see on a lot of different landscape plants. And a lot of the management is going to be very similar. And one of those big management issues or management uh, things that we can do is really looking at our irrigation system. So calibrate your irrigation and improve your air circulation around plants because if you have overhead irrigation that's hitting your azaleas and there's not enough air circulation, that can definitely have, lead to uh, Cercospora, Cercospora uh, leaf spot on your plants. And then um, any fallen leaves, try to remove them so it doesn't spread uh, as it sporulates. Uh, and if there's any, uh, there are uh, approved fungicides that you can apply as part of this management for Cercospora. So, uh, but, you know, again, to prevent any type of outbreak of Cercospora on azalea, but any type of our plants, it really comes back to managing our irrigation and how we're watering those plants. So double check that your irrigation systems are appropriate. So if you do have Cercospora that uh, you identify it on your plants, double check to make sure that they're not getting excessively wet and that they have the ability to dry out because that can help prevent any type of outbreak in the future. So uh, I wanted to skip, sorry, I wanted to skip that one. So wet root rot. Uh, so wet root rot, this is another uh, issue that we'll have with azaleas. So a lot of this can be done associated with, um, again, improving irrigation uh, practices. So that's a cultural control, but also you might have to remove the infected plants. So this wet root rot um, is, 
it's not a fungal it's not a fungal pathogen it's, it's but it's an uh omosate omosates i can i can never remember how to pronounce that appropriately but um it's caused by phytophthora or uh pythium so the uh to id it you're going to be looking for poor growth in a thinning canopy on uh, the azalea as well as the roots or the basal stem are going to be dark and running. So if you're looking down at the base of the plant, you're going to see that um, there's going to be that that could be splitting of that basal stem or that main stem is coming up out of the ground, or you could start to notice some uh, rotting of the roots. So this is happening again during any time of excess moisture and poor planting practices. So if you plant something too deep or if there's poor drainage where the soil is not able to drain quick enough um, and just poor irrigation practices. So one way that you can kind of look is if you're looking at those thin roots, um, you can ID it because if you, what happens is that exterior part of the root starts to rot and you can actually kind of slide it back to expose the interior part of the root. That is a common sign of uh, the wet root rot. So. If you get this, you just, unfortunately, it's just going to be remove infected plants, but it's going to come back to those cultural practices to prevent this from happening in the first place, which would be, you know, improve those irrigation practices. If you have very poor drainage, you know, is azalea the right plant for the right place? What would be a more appropriate plant? As well as thinking about, are you following those best management practices with regards to planting? Because that's a common cause uh, that I've noticed in Alachua County that when this, this happens, it's associated due to poor planting practices as well. So that's wet, wet root rot. So let's talk about palms. So palms, uh, you know, some of the key insects that you can see with any palms across the state is going to be the palm leaf skeletonizer, palmetto weevil, or scale, um, and some diseases that we'll notice are fusarium wilt, any type of bud rot, lethal bronzing disease, and leaf spots. So the insect that we're going to focus on is going to be the palm leaf skeletonizer. So it's a little moth um, and we're more interested or we're going to be concerned about the larval damage that's associated with this moth. Again, it's going to be feeding on the underside of the fronds um, and it's going to leave. So if you look really close, it's going to leave the veins kind of intact and it'll almost look like the the other part, other parts of the frond are just completely missing. So it kind of, that's how it gets that name, like skeletonizer. Um, but you will see them in large clusters, uh, the larvae. And they can have these long silk tubes, tubes on the fronds and they, they'll be filled with frass. So these things, you can easily identify the damage as well as you can easily identify the larva when it's present on the fronds. But the timing, um, they're going to be present throughout the year and you could end up with five possible generations of this uh, larva occurring or the five different generations of the moth throughout the year. So uh, just look for that larva regularly as part of your scouting because again if you can get a, ahead of it early you can manage it and you're not going to have it, the uh, skeletonizing issue with your palms. Um, so <clears throat> As part of it, um, prune your infested fronds, not your infester fronds. Uh, improve, uh, sorry, prune those infested fronds. So that's that's mechanical. So kind of how can you remove the insect? There are some insecticide sprays that you can do to help manage the palm leaf skeletonizer. So, um, <clears throat> and there are ways, there's a question that came in, is there a way to ID moth eggs? So yes, you can. I just don't have the images on here, but. Um, you have the ability to identify and look for the eggs of this specific moth. So, um, but the larval damage is, you know, um, when they're active, you, they're big clusters of like, you could have 25, 50 or more of the, uh, the larva on the single frond kind of in a big cluster. So that's the palm leaf skeletonizer. 
Um, the next big key one, and this is one I know a lot of people are talking about before we even started the presentation earlier today, um, Tom, Claire, Emily, and I were discussing the lethal bronzing that we're seeing here in the city of Gainesville. Um, it's popping up in all the, a lot of the palms, and it's an unfortunate thing because there's not much that we can really do about it once they're infected. Um, so lethal bronzing disease, which used to be called Texas Phoenix palm decline, um, affects a big number of our palms that used to be limited, kind of those Phoenix palms. But now we're even seeing, we're seeing a bunch of other uh, genuses of those palms, like our native cabbage palm. Um, but it is a phytoplasma bacteria. And it's unfortunate because it cannot be cultured, which makes it really difficult to study in labs. Um, and some of the issues or some of the ID or signs that we can see, you're not going to see all of them, but you might see one or a couple of them. But if it has fruit, it's going to drop the fruit very, very quickly. Um, you will see, or if it's developing the fruits, you'll see that they, like the, the flowers will begin to rot um, or brown. Um, the older fronds on uh, the trees, like you see on the image on the right, you're going to actually see that uh, discoloration that um, happening on the older fronds and working its way up to the newer fronds. So looking at that, um, that's where you start to see that discoloration. And one of the big indicators that is just like, yep, it's now dead, is that spear leaf collapse. So that new leaf that's shooting up out of the top of the palm when you kind of just see it kind of falls over, that means uh, that you have the death of the apical meristem. And that's that's the heart of the tree. So um, it, at that point, it's it's dead. Um, and unfortunately, there is no way to once you have it. The only thing to do is uh, immediately remove the tree when tested positive. Um, there's a lot of research going on on what the vector is of this um, for this bacteria. Like how is it spreading? Um, and I know there's there's more that we are learning, but we'll see this year round throughout the state. So this is an important one to keep in mind. And it's important to think about testing. So um, IFAS, we do have some recommendations on how to do the best testing. Um, maybe we can follow up with some of those uh, that specific uh, recommendations. Um, but if I remember correctly, you actually go about like the, I believe the DBH height or go DBH onto the trees and you're actually drilling into the trees um, and you're collecting some of the sawdust that falls out in some of the samples. Um, and you can submit those to a diagnostics lab, but obviously make sure everything's sterilized before you do so. Um, so lethal bronzing is a significant disease that is spreading throughout the state and we're seeing it pop up in different uh, genuses as well. It's not just the uh, Phoenix palms anymore. Um, so always make sure that there's get testing done and as soon as it tests positive, remove it to help keep it from being a vector source so it spread so it doesn't uh, end up being a place where that vector can spread that bacteria to other surrounding trees. So <clears throat> So yes, uh, the question is, is lethal bronze, we had a question come up that says, is lethal bronzing disease contagious? How? So it it spreads as the bacteria that is spread by a vector. Uh, it's an insect, um, we'll believe to be an insect. We're not exactly sure what that vector is, but that is how it is spreading. Um, that is how it is spreading uh, from tree to tree. Um, another question that we had pop in with regards to this is how do we dispose of the infected tree? Uh, reach out to your county extension office to see if there are any specific recommendations. So some places may have, some counties may have different recommendations for how to dispose of them. Here in Alachua County, you uh, cut it down um, just and it no longer is considered a vector source. So it shouldn't spread from there. So uh, you can dispose of it like normal. Um, but make sure you do check with your county extension office to see if they have any specific recommendations based off of their county policies. Um, but lethal bronzing disease, this is one that we're doing a lot of education uh, statewide to help uh, communicate with homeowners, as well as landscape professionals, planners, you name it, any key stakeholder or any stakeholder across the state. This is a big one that we're trying to talk and uh, out, do a lot of outreach about. So lethal bronzing. So let's now talk about crepe myrtle. So crepe myrtles, there are um, 
you know, surprisingly, not too many insects or diseases that we could see on these. Uh, that's really um, becomes nuisance um, because obviously, like one like bark lice isn't on here, but these are some of these uh, nuisance uh, pests and diseases that we can see on crepe myrtles. Um, and you know, this I thought was a good one to bring up just because crepe myrtles are everywhere. Um, so. The key insects or pests, sorry, that we can see are that crepe myrtle aphid, uh, the metallic flea beetles, and crepe myrtle uh, bark scale, not back scale, uh, and some of the diseases like powdery mildew. So uh, crepe myrtle bark scale, um, it is a new pest. Now, we don't necessarily have it uh, have it shown as being here in um, Florida yet. Um, and that's gonna, that's an important uh, thing to note, uh, but we're seeing it in a bunch of the other states uh, in the Southeast. So it is a new, it's a news pest and it's something that we need to be on the lookout for. Um, and we can identify it because of course you'll look for sooty mold. That sooty mold, you'll see it on the leaves and the stems, even on the scale themselves. Um, but they actually are white and gray scales. And when you smush them, they actually have like a, a they ooze a pinkish color um, and they can be pretty prolific. Um, and you will see them year round. And unfortunately, as part of management, you know, we're really trying to learn the best way to manage it and come up with some more of those best management practices. And that's an unfortunate case with some of the diseases or pests that we might in our land, have in our landscape is, we're still trying to figure out the best way to control them or to manage them. So um, just minimize spread through proper ID. So if you are going to a nursery to purchase plants for your home, or if you're going to a wholesaler to get plants selected for um, a big project, make sure that your plants are free of the pest, are free of that crepe myrtle bark scale because you don't want to spread it around the state. So you can wash the trunks and limbs with soapy water, and that's just to help make the insecticide applications a little bit more helpful. Uh, but again, really still learning the best ways to manage these. And if I remember correctly in the document that talks about this, like neem oil, I know some homeowners use to help manage scale. It has a uh, little bit of impact, but it's not going to solve the problem. So just really recognizing what this pest is and knowing it's going to be here. Um, and the best cultural practice that we can do is minimize the spread through proper ID and make sure that we're not bringing in any crepe myrtle that has the bark scale on it. But just be on the lookout because it is on its way in here. It's just a matter of when. So uh, powdery mildew, that is a very common disease that we're going to see on all of our crepe myrtles. So it's, it's pretty recognizable. Um, it has a white powdery covering on the leaves, uh, shoots, and buds. And you'll actually start to see that the leaves, once it gets really bad, and you can see this in the image a little bit, is the leaves start to distort and curl. Um, and you know, usually we're going to see this in like a little bit more shadier conditions, um, but you'll see it during that cool, dry period of the spring and fall. So in Florida, we're probably not going to see too much of powdery mildew right now, but doesn't mean it won't exist. But that uh, white powder covering on the leaves is going to be one of the biggest key indicators uh, that you do have powdery mildew. So some of the management practices is uh, you know, right plant, right place. And those culturals is when you're selecting plants, select some of the varieties that are resistant to powdery mildew. So it to help reduce the of it being a risk in your landscape. Um, there are chemical controls that you can use for um, for uh, managing powdery mildew. But again, if to help limit the need of having to use those chemical controls, saying about integrated pest management selecting those resistant varieties is going to be your best first step to make sure that you don't get to the point where powdery mildew becomes an issue where you have to pray, spray some type of fungicide on the landscape or on the plants to help minimize an outbreak. So this is great for homeowners or working commercially because if you know you're doing a big planned unit development and you're thinking of needing hundreds of crepe myrtles you know think about choosing that uh, resistant variety because if that prevents management companies having to come later and spray fungicides, that's 
really nice. Um, so, but anyways, thinking about that resistant variety is going to be important. And with IFAS, we do have resources and listing of what are those resistant varieties available to you. So crepe myrtle and powdery mildew. Next are the hollies. Um, so hollies, you know, we'll see like Florida wax scale, T scale. Um, we'll see the, the leaf spot die back, tip blight and uh, nematodes. Those are going to be some of the key pests that are going to pop up on our hollies. So, um, you know, and we're not seeing these not just on uh, non-native ones, we're seeing these on native uh, hollies as well. So the, the insect I want to talk about is the wax scale, or that Florida wax scale. These are pretty identifiable. Um, so they have those big like stone looking things on the screen those are the wax scale the adults uh that they have these round convex cream colored scales um on the stems and leaves and they do you can also look for sooty molds on the leaves of course um you'll see these year round and those little guys you see wandering around those are the uh, the, the the nymphs and the, these are soft body scales if i remember correctly um, so we'll see these year round. Um, so always make sure you're checking your hollies. Um, and, you know, going back to this management for it, check for the pest free plants. You know, if you're selecting plants for your landscapes, um, you know, make sure that you're not bringing anything that has the scale because you don't want to intentionally spread to healthy plants. And a comment came in that someone mentioned they had this on their passion vines as well. It's like, yes, there's a lot of these scales that's not going to be just um you're only going to see on hollies if you bring something in that has a certain disease or pet or some pest on it it could easily spread to some of the other plants within the landscape so we'll see these year round check for uh, pest free plants um you know if you have heavily infected areas you can just prune them out um and just continue monitoring make sure they don't they still haven't spread but just prune out but there are systemic insecticides that you can use to help control of the florida wax scale and we're primarily seeing these um i believe on the uh no we're seeing these on all the the holly sorry so um but anyways check for the pest uh free plants when you're doing selection following right plant right place uh, prune out infected and if none of that works you can always go for the systemic insecticide route so um <clears throat> next is the uh spheropsis tip blight uh this is you know kind of an, an interesting uh fungal pathogen that you will see in uh, these ornamental hollies you'll see them in all hollies but you'll primarily see it in the east palaka and savannah holly um but looking at where like the new growth of or the young twigs um, that you see within the, the branches, you're going to have these little swellings. You can actually see it in the image on the right, um, almost like a gull. Um, so and then from that gull, that swelling, sorry, it'll shoot out uh, multiple new growth and like a witch's broom, but it'll also do something with, if it's horizontal or uh, going down, it'll do something we call tip up, where it just starts to kind of tip up and uh, the branches start to tip up from that point. Um, but also the severe infection can lead to dieback um, of those branching. So if you do notice this, it's important to think about not pruning out where the gall is, but go four to six inches back from where the infection is and re completely remove that as kind of a mechanical control, but also as part of that cultural or mechanical control is making sure that you sanitize equipment between cuts. Um, so you do a cut, a prune, or whatever it is, sanitize your equipment uh, between each cut, especially if you know you're dealing with an infective plant. Um, because one of the common vectors that has to deal with uh, pathogens is ourselves, our hands, our pruners, our clippers. So make sure you sanitize everything between the cuts in order to prevent the spreading. Um, and if anything is severely infected, uh, you could completely remove it. So there are fungicides that you can spray, but they're really only going to be effective as a preventative measurement. And that will only be if you apply it right after you prune. Um, and that's going to help prevent because usually the fungal pathogen enters uh, the holly after you prune it and that exposed part of the, the branch, that's where it uh, enters into the plant. Um, 
and what that is going to be where it enters. So you could put that fungal that fungicide right there when you cut it, but it's not necessarily going to be a preventative um, maintenance so uh, or as effective. So just making sure that you prune four to six inches below the affected area and try to remove and sanitize equipment uh, to make sure that you do not spread this tip blight. So the last key plant that we're going to talk about um, before we have time to get into the questions, because there are some questions I know that popped up that we have to answer, uh, is we'll talk about the juniper. So junipers, we'll see them all across the state as trees, as shrubs, you name it, great ground covers. Um, but some of the insects that we'll see are going to be bagworms, uh, different types of mites, scale, um, webworm. Uh, but some of the common diseases that we're going to see are mushroom root rot needle blight, uh, rhizotonia, web blight, tip blight, and again, wet root rot, you know, again, similar to uh, what we could see on the azalea, or is that phytophthora, uh, uh, pythium. Um, so, so let's talk about a key insect and one of the key diseases with these. And I chose these because the two that we're going to talk about because they're similar. Um, they can I'd be ID'd similarly. So the spider mites, um, they are tiny, tiny. So they're about a 50th of an inch. So they're tough to see, but you can see some of the um, other indicators that we see of them is like you can look for eggs, caskin, and the webs. The webs that you see kind of like on the image on the right are pretty good, are a good indicator, but not a telltale sign. Um, but the foliage might also be um, kind of pale or off color, and that's resulted because the mites have piercing mouth parts, so they kind of poke their uh, their piercing mouth part into the plants, and that's kind of related to that damage that's associated with it. But one way to really ID it is you get a white paper, white sheet of paper, and you hold it underneath the branch, and you, you shake it a little bit, and you can actually see the mites fall onto um, the piece of paper and you can kind of see them move around and scatter. But um, if you see different sizes of mites, there could be some that are large and they move much, much quicker on that piece of paper. That's an indicator of the predatorial mite um, and that could, that's a good biological control um, method that could be just naturally occurring within that landscape. So um, you might end up with multiple mites, but the smaller of the two it's a little bit slower, is going to be that spider mite. We are going to see these year round, but it really depends. But at different times of year, you might see different mite species, um, but they can be prevalent year round, it's just different times of the year that might change. Uh, the exact mite you're going to see. So um, some of the management for the spider mites is going to be remove the infected areas. So that's good mechanical control. But um, you can use insecticidal soap, pour oils, or miticides as a chemical control uh, for that management. So the predatory mites, I do not think that they create the webs as well. Um, so it's just uh, something just keep an eye out for. Um, but anyway, so mechanical remove infected by clipping, um, but also there's the chemical controls like the insecticidal soaps, pour oils, or miticides. And uh, I chose Rhizotonia web blight as the other alternative, uh, like disease, because it looks similar to um, the spider mites. And that's why ID is so important when we're thinking about integrated pest management, because if we don't identify that pest properly, our management will be wrong. And we can end up creating more issues by doing improper management. Um, so looking at Rhizoctonia web blight is it occurs on both young and old branching, but it's a fungal, it has, it's a fungal disease and you'll see the hyphae that is similar to uh, the spider mites um, and it'll have that webbing, but no mites will be present. Um, but you can actually get like a little hand lens, you can get in there and you can look, for, look at the, uh, the hyphae and all of that stuff. But doing that paper kind of shake, you know, seeing if those mites fall out, um, you know, is really good way to in determine if you have the spider mites versus the web blight. So proper ID is critical for managing pests properly. 
So um, this is a soil borne pathogen um, and it loves the, our warm summers and having excess of water or a lot of water available to it. Um, and it can easily spread um, and hang out in the soil, but it can easily spread from the infected uh, parts of the plant as well. Um, so the best ways again to control uh, Rhizoctonia web light is if it's what if you're having that as an impact in your landscape and it's impacting your junipers, really do a check of your irrigation. Make sure there's not excessive irrigation, minimize any type of overhead irrigation, improve air circulation. Those are gonna be those cultural control methods that if you're adhering to that, it should, you shouldn't have an issue with it or reduce the risk of it being an issue. Um, and there are some improved fungicides that if needed, but if you do manage the cultural issues, it helps reduce this as being a serious impact on the plant. So, um, but if it's, if the pathogen is pretty um, extensive within the soil and you have to replace the plant, I wouldn't recommend putting a juniper in its place, especially if it's soil borne, because you might have to do some type of soil amendments to help reduce, uh, get rid of it. Otherwise, the new plants might end up getting it. But anyways, so um, that's Rhizoctonia web light. So I chose these again, the spider mites and a Rhizoctonia web light because they can look similar. And if you don't choose, if you don't ID the plant properly, or sorry, identify the pest properly, you could end up uh, choosing the wrong management and that can end up creating more problems. So these are the key plants and the key pests that we talked about today as part of our program. We talked about azaleas, the rhododendrons, uh, the palms, crepe myrtle, hollies, and juniper. So we're seeing these plants, a lot of these plants throughout the states um, and these are the key plants and the key pet and these are just some of the key plants and we only talked about a little bit of the key pests that they do have um but that's why it's important that i i have these resources for you and maybe we could follow up with these links but you know just go to the ask ifas webpage um that's where we have all of our uh published information um and in the ifas webpage we actually have the key plants key pest uh topic um and that slowly building, but there's uh, some publications on there where it will talk about specific plant, how to ID, how to manage, when you're going to kind of see it. Um, and it's great because it goes into detail with all those key plants that we do have published. Um, so, you know, and then again, coming back to it really starts with cultural cho choices. There was a question that popped up as a do junipers even need irrigation in Florida after establishment? It's like, no, you know, if they're the right plant, the right place, they don't need any irrigation to just be supplemental during periods of drought, but they're pretty drought tolerant. So really understanding those cultural practices and going back to right plant, right place with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program really helps us manage our yard pest properly. So following those cultural practices is going to be the preventative measures. And if, again, those don't work. You can think of the physical or mechanical controls. Then you can think about biological controls and if still nothing is working, that's when you can jump into, or still nothing working or there's not a proper management that's available. You can think about those intervention methods, which would be you know, something like a chemical control. So we're now at the point where we're at the end. So uh, hopefully you feel more confident answering these two essential questions. So what is integrated pest management and what are key pests to key plants in Florida? So I hope you learned something, but if anything, I think it's just understanding that ID is very important or properly identifying uh, the pests in our landscape is step one and monitoring regularly is going to be key to making sure that we're managed strong, resilient landscapes. Um, for Florida, as well as, you know, you should be able to help and those key pests and key plants in Florida. But anyways, so um, here is my contact information if you want to reach out to me. Um, the UFL email is probably going to be the best. Um, but anyways, thank you all so much. And um, I think we're open to questions now and be able to follow up with what we got. Yeah. Fantastic, Taylor. Thank you so very much. Um, you oh, covered uh, a lot of material in the last uh, 50 minutes or so. And um, I, I know that there's a few questions that have popped up. Um, I'll try and field some of those that uh, came er from early on. Um, when you're scouting for mole crickets with the soapy water, um, should uh, they be concerned about the soapy water actually hurting the turf? 
Um, so there would be concerns, I think, because some of the soaps, you can have like salts that are in it. Um, and so if you're using it excessively, it could end up causing an issue. But if you are doing as part of your, your scouting, so like for mole crickets, I wouldn't say go out every single week and just pour soapy water all over your landscape. But if you're seeing damage within that turf grass area and you know your turf grass is susceptible to mole crickets, um, then if you're seeing where that damage might be occurring, then you can do that soapy water test to see if they're present in that space. So the frequency that you're doing it is very, very low, so it shouldn't be of concern. But good question. Very good question. Yeah, because you yeah. just don't want to just willy-nilly pour salt. That, how, how much soap is in there and what detergent it is, you know, there's a lot of variables. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but because I think the recommendation is just soapy water. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, next one was, do you have any experience with the uh, banana moth on palms in South Florida? No, I, know, I do not. Yeah, you're here in North Florida, and so I, I, I kind of <laughs> didn't think you would. Um, Vicky from uh, uh, Montgomery Botanical Gardens is having an issue. I know there's a good uh, uh, document on Ask Ipis, so uh, you know I would encourage you to check that out. Um, and I don't have any personal experience with it, but it uh, looks like a nasty little pest. Yeah. Uh, do you know how many lace bugs hatch in a generation? Thousands or hundreds? Oh boy. I bet it <laughs> they, they ask tough questions. <laughs> I don't know these que I don't know these answers, you know, because of how prevalent. I, I mean, I bet it's in the hundreds, but in a generation, but oh my gosh, sometimes they can be so prolific, you'd think it'd be within the thousands, but um, more than likely probably in the hundreds. Yeah. And, and I did look it up um, while you were talking. So, um, it was, uh, it says that there's around 300 eggs um, per, per per generation and they could have two to four generations per year. So that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, another person has an insect on purple shower Ruelia. Seems like some type of scale. Have you ever seen that? I haven't seen a scale on Ruelia. Um, <sighs> I'd be interested in kind of seeing, it wouldn't surprise me if we would get a scale on Ruelia, just because if you have scale present in the landscape, you know, some of them are not going to be discriminatory on what plants they go after. Um, so it could be worth um, sending images to your county agent to make sure they get properly identified. Uh, so we can um, give a recommendation. So of course, in Alachua County, if it's Ruelia, I might say, yeah, take it out. But um, but I believe that's one of the cereal varieties. I'm not, I, I believe so. But anyways, um, so yeah, send images and try to see if we can get a proper ID on it. But it wouldn't surprise me that you could get scale on Ruelia. Yeah, me, you know, wouldn't shock me either. But yeah. as you say, I haven't seen scale on it either, but it's, you know, so many, scale can get on so many things. <laughs> yeah. um, do predatory mites weave webs? I do not think they do. Um, I'd have to double check uh, because I think that's just one of the characteristics of the spider mites. Um, I don't think those predatory mites are going to be uh, weaving the web. So if you're seeing those webs, it's not going to just be an indicator of the predatory mites. So I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. I've, I've never seen them weave a web, but um, I'd have to do a little more research to know if they, mm -hmm. there are any species possible of outside of the spider mites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, should we be concerned about small snails in the soil? It, it depends. <laughs> so, uh, because we do have, you know, with, with snails, we do have some predatory snails that are, you know, they're champions of the garden. If you have them, it's like, keep them around, let them hang out. But some can be a nuisance. Um, one way that like, it's a nice way to control them if they're problematic, like if they're in a vegetable garden, um, one recommendation I do have is in like that sunny area where, or it gets sun in the afternoon, put like a, a flat rock down or cardboard or something in that sunny area, because once that sun comes out, they're going to be looking for protection. So they're going to, they, there, a lot of them might move underneath that flat rock or it could be even cardboard or wood lifted up. And that's a great way to kind of get a lot of them in one spot. Um, one of our uh, botanist, uh, Mark Frank at the herbarium, he said a he he recommends a little pie dish or a little can uh, or flat dish with cheap beer will attract actually a lot of the 
the, the snails. And it, there's a good strategy for IB, but also you can get a lot of them in one spot. So it's easy to remove them mechanically. Bring them to you rather than go hunting for them. <laughs> Very nice. Are there uh, new chemical alternatives that work as well as the neonicoto neonicotinoids? That's a really good question for the pesticide information office. Um, and, you know, we do have a lot of really great uh, pesticides that can work alternatively than to neonicotinoids. Because one of the big things that is going to be important is making sure that you rotate those modes of action. Because no matter what type of insecticide or pesticide that you use, if you're not going to rotate those modes of action, they're not going to be effective. Um, so really making sure that you're following those best management practices. That's a really good question for the pesticide information office, you know, for, especially for any detailed question about, you know, alternatives, or if it is um, better use or looking at those best management practices for specific insecticides or pesticides. Okay. Um, any thoughts on the use of BT? So BT can be a very beneficial biological control. It's just making sure that you select the appropriate strain of, for your garden. Um, and, but you still, I would recommend being careful because, you know, a BT application in your garden, you could also end up killing some of those beneficial insects. But it is a good, it is a biological control that could be very beneficial. Um, because you can also get BT tablets that say you have something that holds water outside um, that can be great for controlling mosquito larvae. Uh, but the same BT used for soft body insects like caterpillars or larval uh, larvae, um, isn't going to necessarily be the same that you use for mosquitoes. So make sure you read the label and follow the label. Um, but BT can be very beneficial. But again, you know, what are those cultural and mechanical control methods that you can do prior to using BT? So um, if you have a tomato hornworm or or here's a good here's a good better example related to landscape plants. So say you have your azalea and you have azalea caterpillars come in can you easily control them mechanically by just removing them? Or if that is the outbreak so bad where it's like, okay, I'm just gonna have to use BT. So making sure you go through that IPM strategy is are those a cultural or mechanical methods that you can use prior to using BT, but BT is a good uh, biological control method. All right, here's a philosophical question for you. Ooh. <laughs> um, you know, this, uh, this gentleman has you know, lots of, he, he sees tons and tons of Indian hawthorn and gold mound being, being planted um, despite all the pests that they have. Um, and he wants to know why, why these plants are, are so popular despite the fact that they constantly have all these problems. Um, Do you he, want my short answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they're cheap. I mean, that's, if you're looking at, if, it, which is unfortunate. So there's, so one of the issues that we do see with a lot of just like insect pressure, let's go back to Floritam as a good example. It was developed because it had chinch bug resistance to it, but we started planting a lot of it because it was cheap, it was readily available, and it did have that resistance, but we planted a lot of it. So chinch bugs were like, hey, cool, let me adapt because Mother Nature is cool like that. And now the chinch bugs, they can't, they, the Floritam is losing its resistance is a better way to put it. So that's just because of how much we planted. So it's really important to think about diversity of plant selection. And when we're thinking about the developers or the builders or putting in landscapes, they're thinking of what can I do to lower my overhead so um, I'm not losing money on jobs and they're going to go for some of the cheaper plants or the plants that are readily available. So it's really working with, you know, county officials um, and county code or whoever those policymakers are to think about how can we change county code or policy to include a specific diversity of plant choices because if we can change the demand, that supply can change as well and help improve diversity of plant selection within the landscape. Um, so it really ultimately is going to come back to cost, but there are cool strategies that we can do 
to help see if we can change that demand. Um, and if we can, we're going to see plants that have a natural resilience, or if there is pest pressure, when we talk about landscape resilience, we look for redundancy and diversity. And that helps if like, say a certain plant gets infected with the disease or uh, some type of uh, pest, then it's only gonna be isolated kind of that space. Whereas, you know, you have hundreds of Indian hawthorns all in a big clump, something comes in, broop, that whole area gets taken out. So, um, I think it was a really good question. I think I don't know if I answered it 100% directly, but um, really thinking of how can we improve diversity, but it really does come back to typically it's going to be that overhead cost. Taylor, and I think you hit it right on the head when you said the about the importance of diversity. Um, you know, whenever we have too much of one thing planted, um, you know, there's going to ultimately be pest pressure that's going to take it out. And a landscape will be much more resilient if you have you know, lots of different species of plants there. That way, if a pest does come and take some, you know, one species out, it, you know, you're not sacrificing the entire landscape, so. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, and that goes back to IPM strategies. It's, let's, these are strategies that you can use as part of that cultural control, which can be just selection um, at the very beginning, because that ends up becoming a preventative strategy to pre prevent issues from taking over, so. Or for letting resistant varieties lose their resistance, like our Floratam. Yeah. Just a just a couple more questions. Um, any experience with cottony cushion scale? Um, no, I do not. It's one, um, of, one of those pests that uh, gets on Indian hawthorn. That uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming it's a soft body uh, scale, yeah. but no, I don't have any. Um, I, you know, you know, in our office, we've never had any calls with regards to really Indian Hawthorne, uh, but we're not seeing it too prevalently as a landscape plant here in Alachua County, as compared as we used to. It used to be everywhere. I mean, you'll still see it. It was like the primary parking lot plant, I think, for <laughs> a long time. But, um, but no, I haven't had too many questions come across the desk with regards to that. And I don't have Indian Hawthorne in my landscape. Yeah, you see it on Indian Hawthorne, you see it on Pittosporum. Um, it's, you know, fairly easily controlled with horticultural oils, um, you know, much like a lot of our scales. So it, you know, it's just big, ugly, and nasty. Um, I kind of think, you know, when I'm talking to homeowners, neem oil or horticultural oil is always a safe bet to keep in your arsenal um, because it's, it's a chemical control you could argue as a biological control, I guess, but we treat it as a chemical control, but on the grade of chemical controls is kind of pretty low on those consequences that we we're talking about earlier with regards to social, economic, environmental. Good. Um, is lethal bronzing becoming a major issue? And do you know where the hot spots are? Everywhere. And yes. Um, <laughs> so it originally showed up in, I believe, Pinellas County. Or manatee, I think it's kind of where, um, and we saw it actually in Texas first, and I believe it was like someone in like Norway or the Netherlands first ID'd it in Texas. I can't remember the whole story, but um, that's why it has, it was in Texas, it was first ID'd, um, and that's why it has that Texas Phoenix Palm decline originally was called. We saw it in Pinellas County uh, back in the mid early 2000s um, and it has slowly spread throughout the state it's kind of been focused in the south florida area central south florida area um and alachua county but you know we're starting to see it's you know if you have a palm it's going to be in that county i don't know if we have any counties where it's not listed as being present now but i'm not entirely sure but it is it's one of those things where and Tom, you may agree with me, it's, it's at the level of citrus screening, or it's going to be at that level of citrus screening with regards to how we make sure we outreach, because it's going to have, it can have substantial economic and environmental impacts um, throughout the state. Well, we're seeing a lot of the palms on campus succumb to um, lethal bronzing, and, you know, it's, it's a real problem, and as you say, it is affecting our our uh, state tree, um, our mm -hmm. native cabbage palm. So yeah, and that that always concerns me because it was on the native the the phoenix palms, and we're seeing it now on our native palms, and it just 
you know, how far away a step is it from kind of like our cabbage or sorry, like our blue stem palmettos or saw palmettos. And then that could be an environmental impact, a pretty significant one. So that, that, that one kind of freaks me out a little bit. So. Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for taking the time to today to present key plants, key pests. This is a, you know, it's a topic that's so, um, so important that I think people can know what to expect and how to find their pests if, if they do kind of go in when they're planting their plants, they kind of know what to look for. Um, so I think that that's really important. And um, you hit upon a, some really important things. Uh, ID is, is ultimately important. Um, so, you know, utilize your, your local cooperative extension office. You utilize the, the disease clinic and the disease lab on campus. Um, you know, utilize those services to make sure you get the, the right identification before you try and do any sort of management. So, um, Absolutely. Taylor, thank you for, for all the expertise and all the time and, and answering all these questions. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you doing this for us today. Oh, my pleasure. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad I was able to do this. And, you know, to everybody, just if any questions, reach out to your county extension office. Use IFAS as a resource for you so we can help with that ID and management and just keep you updated on those best management practices. So I appreciate you all inviting me to come do this. This is fun. Fantastic. All right. You have a great day. Everyone, thank you so much. And uh, please join us next month uh, for our next webinar. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.